Johnny presents the Milton Berle Show. Make no mistake, of all leading cigarettes, Philip Morris, and only Philip Morris, is recognized by eminent nose and throat specialists as definitely less irritating. No other cigarette can make that statement. From Radio City, New York, here is the Milton Berle Show. With Bert Kelton, Jack Alberson, Mary Ship, Johnny Gibson, Charlie Irving, Billy Sands, Frank Milano, our singing star Dick Farney, Ray Block and his orchestra, and yours truly, Frank Gallo. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen... That's a gem. <laughs> <laughs> with the number of presidential candidates increasing daily, tonight we salute the great game of politics. We now bring you a man who's been asked many times to throw his hat in the ring. Under one condition that he throw his head in with it. <laughs> and here he is, Milton Berle. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're right, Mr. Gallup. You're right. Have you ever seen so many candidates for president? Now, now we know who the walking man really is. He's the one Republican who isn't running. <laughs> I hear, thank you, Democrats. I hear, I hear that at the last minute, the Republicans may run a dark horse for president. They might as well try a horse. In 16 years, they haven't been able to do it with a man. <laughs> I, re I really did. There hasn't, there hasn't been a Republican in, in the White House in so long. If one gets in, he won't recognize the place. So many changes. Now the White House has running water and electricity. <laughs> yeah, when the Republicans were in, there was no electricity. It was terrible. They had a Hoover and no place to plug them in. <laughs> After all, Washington is D.C. <laughs> D.C. Oh, that's a current joke. <laughs> oh, I could go on. I could go on like this for seconds. <laughs> really? No. No. Oh, it's you, Mr. Gallup. It's you. I didn't recognize you. I love that voice. Buzz, buzz. That sounds like John L. Lewis calling all men to Barney's. <laughs> what is it, uh, what is it, Mr. Gallup? Burl, how can you comment on political affairs? You, who are studying to be a moron, and I think you'll make it. <laughs> oh, nothing. <laughs> Mr. Um, Mr. Gallup, may I say you are a doll? You're a doll, and twice as waxy. <laughs> Stop working so hard. You really keep your nose to the grindstone. You've kept it there too long. Now it's down to a needle. <laughs> Last time I'll buy jokes from an usher. <laughs> I want to... I mean, what do you do with a nose like that at night? Put it in an umbrella stand? <laughs> Put it in an umbrella stand? <laughs> what is this man laughing at that doesn't impress this woman over there? It's all right. I'm ripping you, Mr. Gallup, but do me a favor. Don't be offended. Look at me. Uh, I can take a joke. Show me one you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, <laughs> oh, I could think of an ad lib if I had it written. <laughs> We'll get a bigger laugh than that. Good night. Uh, what's the... Uh, what's the... Uh, what are we talking about uh, tonight? Politics. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, politics. Yes. Well, speaking of politics... <laughs> good telescoping, you notice. <laughs> Mr. Gallup, was your family ever politically inclined? Oh, yes. Boston, you know. Boston? Yes, we're rather conservative. Your family is conservative? Rather, they still refer to Coolidge as that communist in the White House. In other words, Mr. Gallup, your family likes things as they were. Yes. Dad is still chairman of the Beacon Hill Committee to bring back George III. No! <laughs> Well, you're really conservative. Oh, yes, for years, my family has leaned so far to the right. Four of my uncles are mentally unbalanced. <laughs> I should have quit when we were even. Did any, uh... 
Did any of your family, Mr. Gallup, ever hold office? No, but my uncle, Velvel Gallup, once ran... Velvel Gallup? <laughs> yes, Velvel Gallup. Nice name. Yes, nice uncle. No joke. <laughs> He once ran for governor on a pension plan. For years, he stood on a platform of ham and eggs. What happened? He had the messiest feet in town. <laughs> no yoke. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, no, I mean, how, uh, Mr. Gallup, how did uh, your uncle come out? He lost, and after that, naturally, he committed suicide. Your uncle killed himself? How? He threw himself into a vat of Jergens lotion and softened to death. <laughs> oh, that was clever. Um... <laughs> I must say, that was a beautiful yarn, and you should have it knitted into two little sweaters for the bags under your eyes. <laughs> but on with the show, as we salute the cradle of American politics, Washington, D.C. Washington, Washington, beautiful gem of the nation, democratic Washington. Any citizen can pick up his phone, call Washington, and you'll get an answer. It's a candy store. Ask for Martha. <laughs> But to see Washington is to know it. So come with me, dear listeners. Won't you? <laughs> Won't you? <laughs> On a boat trip up the famous Potomac River, as we point out the historic landmarks of our nation's capital, we board our trusty little excursion boat, and we are off with a roar of its mighty engine. <laughs> First stop is the White House. The White House. Maybe we can go in and see the president. There he is. Oh, no. He's too busy working. I see. He hasn't finished the porch yet. <laughs> so up Capitol Hill we go, stepping carefully over lobbyists, and we find ourselves in front of the House of Representatives. To a janitor sweeping in front, we say, uh, Janitor, would you open the door and let us listen to Congress? Why, of course. Here you are. I said thank you. Can't hear you. There's too much racket. Wait a minute. <laughs> now, what was that? I, I I just said thank you. Oh, that's okay. All right, you guys. <laughs> That sounded excited. They did sound exciting. Uh, what were they discussing? The Marshall Report? Nope. Kinsey Report. <laughs> well, let's get back to the White House. The porch is done. Maybe the president will see us now. How do you like that? He had to do it all over again. He had it on the wrong side. It was facing the south. <laughs> and as we board our faithful little boat, it is off with a roar of its mighty engine. <laughs> Here we are standing before the imposing Treasury Department building. It is March 16th. Mail is pouring in from all over the country. Look, there is the Secretary of Treasury at work in his office. As he opens each envelope and the checks come tumbling out, we can hear him say... <laughs> but before we leave Washington, let's try the White House once more. Ah, the porch is done. Now at last the president can roll up his sleeves and get down to work. And as the beautiful strains of the Missouri waltz come floating out of the White House and the Southern Democrats play Ring Around the Rosie on the White House lawn, we say farewell to Washington. And as we wave to the captain of our trusty little boat, he sadly waves back and says... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, enough words have been written about cigarettes and smoking pleasure to fill every library from here to Timbuktu. But you'll never hear words that make more sense, words that are more important to you who smoke, than the words you are about to hear now. For these words were written by one of America's top-ranking doctors. Listen to what the doctor had to say. In cases of irritation of the nose or throat, it is my usual practice with my patients who smoke to suggest that they change to Philip Morris. And why does the doctor advise this change to Philip Morris? Listen. 
The reason for this advice is that I am convinced that they are less irritating than other cigarettes. Remember, if your cigarette leaves your throat dry and parched, if it makes you cough or leaves a stale, musty taste in your mouth, these definitely are reasons for a change to Philip Morris. So join the thousands who every day are discovering in Philip Morris a cleaner, fresher, milder smoke, a deeper, richer smoking pleasure than they've ever known before. Yes, call for Philip Morris. And remember, of all leading cigarettes, the superiority of Philip Morris and only Philip Morris is recognized by eminent nose and throat specialists. No other cigarette can make that statement. Thank you, that was babyface. You can play the rest of it in about five weeks. Um, on sustaining. That was Babyface, played by Ray Block and the Philip Morris Orchestra. And you know something, Ray? Your playing reminds me of a drunk who comes home late at night. He also has trouble finding the right key. <laughs> also has trouble. <laughs> Are you sore because I won't let you sleep? <laughs> well, <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, as we continue our salute to politics, we now present... Political Forum tonight. Political Forum tonight. The question, what do we have to do in order to have a fourth party? Go out and drink a fifth? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Shenley. Let us, um, <laughs> let us commence with questions from the folks in our audience. All right, this young man in the first row who just paid his income tax and is wearing a double-breasted barrel. The young man, uh, tell me, what is your name? My name is Ray Block. <laughs> Ray, Ray Block? I'm not the one on your program. I know. I'm a musician. <laughs> well, that figures. Of course, Ray Block isn't my real name. No? I changed it because with the name I had before, my life wasn't worth a cent. What was your name before? Milton Berle. <laughs> All right, uh, Menasha, you have a question. <laughs> you, you have a question that... Well, you... <laughs> You have a question that has to do with politics. Politics? Watch with the politics, Jack. I thought this was a comedy program. Well, I thought... Why don't you stick to subjects you know something about, like chicken cleaning? I just... If I'm supposed to vote for you, then I've got a bigger hole in my head than you have. Look, you... Before I vote for you, I'd rather give up my citizenship and move to Brooklyn. Look, I... Before I vote for you, I'd rather see Mortimer Slurred in the White House. Please. Now your mother's ballot. <laughs> No applause. Don't encourage him. He'll want a show of his own. <laughs> he may have it soon. Let us hear... Let us... Let us hear from... The, I keep laughing at my own jokes so they won't get lonesome. You know? <laughs> let us hear from the ladies in our audience. All right, this lady in the third row helping her beaver coat build a dam across the aisle. <laughs> What is your name, madam? Tallulah Feeney. I'm a homemaker. I see. And you have a question that concerns itself with politics. Yeah. How can I stop my husband from running around with all them politician big shots? They're always bringing him home half shot. Your husband is something of a politician? He's a Republican and he's a Democrat. You know, half elephant and half donkey. <laughs> Half elephant and half donkey? Yeah, and I don't have to tell you which half of them's the donkey. <laughs> you slowly get that and then begin to hate it. I see what you mean. Them politician friends of his give him jobs with the city. Once they made him a fireman. They made your husband a fireman? Yeah, and his first call, he got a terrible second-degree burn. He burned himself at a fire? Yeah, he burned his stomach sliding down a brass pole. <laughs> I see. This winter he had a good job with the city. All he had to do was remove all the garbage from Brooklyn. Oh, he must have been good. Good? Where do you think all that garbage in the Bronx come from? <laughs> you mean he brought the garbage from one end of the city to the other? Yeah, he just kept kicking it uptown till it disappeared. <laughs> I understand. All that hanging around with politicians really paid off. Last week the county come through with something for him. The county gave him something? Yeah, 90 days. Thank you, Mrs. Feeney. Thank you very much. Tonight, our forum on politics is honored by the presence of a real fighting politician, a man who runs his powerful machine with an iron hand, big, burly, and blustering, Boss Featherfield. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Featherfield. Thank you, Mr. Burrow. (laughs) 
My heart overflows with gratitude for this glorious opportunity to thank my followers who are always behind me and support me where I need it most. <laughs> Mr. Featherfield, let's be frank. Isn't it true that a politician, uh, that as a politician, you must have lost me in your blood? No comment. No comment? <laughs> no blood. <laughs> You have no blood? Mr. Burrow, every time I cut my finger, it just fizzes for a little while and goes flat. <laughs> Mr. Featherfield, when did the big shots first realize that you would make a great politician? When they discovered I was the most active man in my ward. What ward were you in? The psychopathic ward. <laughs> Mr. Featherfield, something was wrong with you? Yes, I had the strangest delusion. I kept dreaming I was alive. <laughs> well, that's serious. Tell us, does your wife help you during your campaigning? Oh, yes. My wife covers three precincts. She's active? She's fat. <laughs> Mr. Featherfield, women don't like to be called fat. Say your wife is a little broad. My wife's a big broad. <laughs> All right, now, now, come, come, Mr. Featherfield. Control yourself, control yourself. I can't help it. I feel so jazzy tonight. <laughs> All right, simmer down, Mr. Featherfield. Your wife continually amazes me. She amazes me, too. At the breakfast table, I just sit there and look at her. You just look at her? Yeah. Who can eat? <laughs> your wife, your married life doesn't seem a very happy one. Why, Mr. Burrell, my wife and I are just like a couple of birds. A couple of birds? Yeah, she's an old crow and I'm a dead duck. Thank you, Mr. Featherfield, very much. Thank you. Young singing star Dick Carney to sing Passing Fancy. They call a romance a passing fancy. They say I'll soon be back at the old routine. They tell me you're not. The kind to fall And if I'm on your mind at all I'm only part of the passing scene They call this rapture A passing fancy a dream they can see the future on. But you know me, and darling, I know this is not a passing fancy. This is love. This is not a passing fancy. This is life. Wonderful, Dick Carney. Isn't he swell? What a voice. But I used to sing like that. Stanley. Oh, I'd sacrifice anything come what might for the sake of having you near in spite of the warning voice that keeps repeat, repeat, repeat my ear. Don't you know you, uh, you never can win? Use your mentality. Wake up to reality. For each time that you do, just before you makes me stop. That's all. <laughs> Take the applause sign down. <laughs> Mr. Gallup, you know, it's wonderful. Any American kid, getting back to politics, any American kid, I was just thinking, can grow up to be president. Th this fact was brought home to me just this week. My wife and uh, I and my neighbors, Sam and Martha Harrison, had just come out of a neighborhood movie, and we were walking home. All right. <laughs> Oh, what a big 
picture. My sides are still aching from laughing at that Danny Kaye. Hey, Martha. Yes. <laughs> when he got hit with that custard... What's wrong, Milton? You haven't said a word all the way home. Oh, leave him alone, Sam. He's always like that when someone else gets a laugh. It's, it's, it's not that. I, I was thinking of those newsreels we saw. All those candidates and President Truman. I mean, they look like men who could live on our block. I mean, it could be any one of us. Why don't you run for president, Milty? I'll be your campaign manager. <laughs> oh, knock off, will you, Sam? Oh, Milton Berle for president. <laughs> That's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. Yes. <laughs> Very funny. Well, here's your house. Good night, Sam. Good night. Milton for president. <laughs> Oh, that's Sam. Every time I hear him, I expect to get a bulletin from the zoo saying one of our hyenas... Don't go away. <laughs> he drives me crazy, that Sam Harrison. I don't know what I'm saying. That's the trouble with me. I don't know what I'm saying. Here's the house. I'll open the door. Gee, imagine being president. Being at the wheel of the ship of state. Gosh. Okay, Skipper, I'm going to bed. How about you? <laughs> Still laughing at Danny Kane? Ah, <laughs> uh, you can go and laugh it off and go to bed. I'm, I'm, I'm restless. That's Sam Harrison. I'll just sit here in the living room for a while. Good night. Good night. I'll just sit down here in front of the fireplace. Ah, gee, it's cozy with that red light on under those cardboard logs. <laughs> mm, must be getting sleepy. Gee, imagine being the president. Gee, four years without options. No agent's commission. Mm. The president. No more insults for Mr. Gallup. No more worrying about sponsors. Imagine being the president of the United States. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I can't describe the jubilation going on here in the Milton Berle for President headquarters when word just came in that Milton Berle was elected President of the United States. Yeah! At the microphone with me is President Berle's campaign manager, the Honorable Sam Harrison. <laughs> Other candidates promised you a chicken in every pot. Berle only made one promise. If you've got the chicken, he's got the pot. <laughs> And now, here is the newly elected President of the United States, Milton Berg. Thank you, thank you, fellow Americans. And to my worthy opponents, Mr. Dewey, Mr. Vandenberg, Mr. Truman, General MacArthur, Mr. Warren, Mr. Stassen, Mr. Taft, Mr. Bricker, Mr. Landon, Mr. Cantor. I can only say my victory couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Hello? Yes, this is the White House. What? Wait, I'll get a pencil. Okay, you want seven hamburgers, three with mustard. Wait a minute. Oh, you want the White Tower. Let's see. Well, that's, that's Monument 4637. You ask for Irving. Tell him the president sent you. You'll get a pickle. No, no, no trouble at all. Thank you. Remember me in 52? There's a story, the gypsies. Guess I'll read the newspaper. Huh. How do you like that? One day in office and they're picking on me. Just because I made my bookie secretary of the treasury. <laughs> Wait till they find out Rocky Graziano is my new attorney general. <laughs> I think I'll make up a few new laws. Milton. Ah, my first lady. First lady, first schmady. Help me move the furniture. Help me move the furniture. Help me move the furniture. Give me a chance. Give me a chance. Give me a chance. Quiet, quiet. Shh, people will hear. See that filing cabinet? It could be Drew Pearson. <laughs> now, what do you want? Milton Burl, you go right over to Congress and demand they paint our bathroom. Okay, okay. Just let me relax. <laughs> oh, no. I thought they were supposed to leave three days ago. <laughs> what happened? Well, they can't find an apartment. Oh, oh. 
Will you please ask Harry to move some of his stuff and give us a little room? Thirty closets, all filled with caps. <laughs> oh, brother. Well, that's that's Sam and Martha. Come in. Hi, Milty. <laughs> Thanks for making me Postmaster General. Forget it, Sam. Wait till you see the new three-cent stamp I'm putting out. It's a picture of Martha standing on Jim Farley. <laughs> Sam, will you look at the newspapers? They're already criticizing the appointments. Our newest appointment will stop that. Say, Martha. Yes? Shall we tell them? Yes. <laughs> Sam, what is it? Martha is going to be Speaker of the House. Ma- d- d- Martha, the Speaker? No. Yes. <laughs> Sam, the newspapers will murder us. Oh, that's the newspaper man now for your first press conference. Press conference? G- give me a chance to put on a clean T-shirt. Please. <laughs> Come in, boys. Mr. President, do you like Washington? Boys, he I... He says you don't like Washington. Boys, he I... He wants to move the White House to a different city. Boys, what I... What city are you going to move it to? Boys, I... Boise, Idaho? He's going to move the capital of Boise, Idaho. What a story! Boise, Idaho! Boys, I... I'm going to move the White House to Boise. Sam, do me a favor. Call them back. Now you did it, Burr. You and your big mouth. Yes. <laughs> oh, quiet. Sam, do something. We will, Milty. You're on the air in a minute. Th- on the air? A radio debate. Should Milton Burrell be impeached? One day in office, I'm, I'm impeached. It's, it's been on the air for an hour already. Just listen. And in conclusion, may I say this fiend, this crumb Burrell, should be impeached because he dares to move our beloved White House out to the untracked waste of Idaho. Citizens, Burl must go. Uh, I'll, I'll tell him off. Ladies and gentlemen, in line with this network's policy of giving equal time to both sides of the question, here is President Burl. Thank you. Boys, I... This brings to an end our debate. <laughs> you heard both sides. America, wake up. Burl must go. <laughs> equal time. The Alka-Seltzer fizz gets more time. Sam, the country's rising against me. Let's get to Idaho. Yes? Mr. President, I'm the senator from Idaho, and I'm warning you to stay out of my state. I'll get every western senator, representative, and the sons of the pioneers behind me. Well, who wants to move? Sam, where is Idaho? I don't know. You don't know? Who don't know? You don't know? I don't know. We don't know. Does anybody know? Yes. (laughs) Quiet. Senator, the whole country's against me. You stay out of Idaho. Our potato crop is being ruined by the Armenian tsetse bug. One pest is enough. But, but I'm against the Armenian tsetse bug. Down with the Armenian tsetse bug. Who's that? Announcing the ambassador from Armenia. President Barone? Yes. You have insulted the fair name of the Armenian tsetse bug. The tsetse bug? I'm here to inform you that a state of war now exists between us. War? Boys, I... War! Burl, here's your uniform. Hail to our commander-in-chief. Where's my army? You're the only one going. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to be president. I don't want to be president. I don't want to, I don't want to be president. Let go of me. Let go of me. Milton, wake up. Wake up. You've been dreaming. Who? What? Duh. I don't want to go to Idaho. Oh, duh. Dreaming? Yes. You mean I'm not the president of the United States? I'm just plain no talent, schmo, Milty Burrow? Yes. I'm just Milty Burrow. I'm not the president. I'm just Milty Burrow. Milty Burrow. Here's Ken Roberts. Friends, remember the words of the eminent nose and throat specialist whose statement you heard a little while ago. In cases of irritation of the nose or throat, it is my usual practice with my patients who smoke to suggest that they change to Philip Morris. Yes, there's a difference in Philip Morris that distinguishes it from any other leading brand. And to you, that difference means a cleaner smoke, a fresher, milder smoke than you've ever known before. Remember, of all leading cigarettes, the superiority of Philip Morris and only Philip Morris is recognized by eminent nose and throat specialists. No other cigarette can make that statement. This is Johnny again, returning now to the thousands of store windows and counters all over America. Look for me. I'll be waiting for you. Come in and call for Philip Morris. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.